The NTSB has recently released its preliminary report into the fatal crash of a Cirrus SR-22 GTS Turbo, tail number November 969 Sierra Sierra, that occurred at Barwick Lafayette Airport in Georgia on March 20, 2025. The accident took the lives of both men on board during what was intended to be a routine training flight. While initial reactions may have focused on pilot error, the newly released findings offer a more nuanced view. They reveal critical details about the aircraft's configuration, its approach profile, and environmental conditions in the moments leading up to the crash. As investigators move closer to identifying the underlying cause, this early analysis sheds light on a complex and sobering event. Let's take a look. The aircraft involved in the accident was a Cirrus SR-22 GTS Turbo, a 2006 model equipped with a Continental I-0550N turbo-normalized engine configured by Tornado Alley Turbo. The SR-22 is a four-seat, high-performance general aviation aircraft commonly used for personal travel and advanced flight training. Known for its advanced glass cockpit avionics and robust safety features, the aircraft also carried the Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, a whole aircraft ballistic parachute designed for emergency use. In this incident, however, the parachute system remained unused and intact within the fuselage, likely due to the extremely low altitude of the crash, which rendered deployment ineffective. The plane bore the registration November 969 Sierra Sierra and was owned and operated privately. It featured a fixed tricycle landing gear and had flaps configured to 50% at the time of impact, an appropriate setting for approach. Post-crash examination found all major flight controls, including the ailerons, elevator, and rudder, to have full continuity, indicating that the aircraft's primary systems were operational right up to the moment of impact. There were two occupants on board. The pilot receiving instruction was Stephen Boyd Powell, a 52-year-old private pilot from Cartersville, Georgia. Powell owned the aircraft and was working toward obtaining his commercial license. Accompanying him was flight instructor Russell Edward Jones, age 48, from Lafayette, Georgia. Jones was a certified flight instructor providing in-air instruction for Powell's ongoing training. Tragically, both men sustained fatal injuries in the crash. There were no survivors. The flight was conducted under Part 91 as a general aviation instructional flight operating under VFR. No formal flight plan was filed. The aircraft departed from Richard B. Russell Regional Airport in Rome, Georgia at approximately 1.36 p.m. to pick up the instructor at Barwick Lafayette Airport. After landing around 1.50 p.m., the two men took off again at 2.21 p.m. for a series of practice landings, an essential part of pilot training known as traffic pattern work. While the first two landing attempts appeared normal, the third approach would end in disaster. After taking off from Barwick Lafayette Airport at approximately 2.21 p.m. on March 20, 2025, the Cirrus SR-22 GTS Turbo entered a standard traffic pattern for runway 20. According to ADSB data and multiple eyewitness accounts, the aircraft completed two circuits of the pattern without incident. These maneuvers are common during instructional flights, particularly for pilots pursuing commercial certification, and are designed to reinforce landing precision, coordination, and situational awareness. However, on the third circuit, witnesses observed a stark deviation from the earlier stable patterns. The aircraft was reported flying noticeably lower than usual during the final approach and appeared to be in an unusually nose-high pitch attitude. This was an immediate red flag, as such an attitude during final approach, especially when coupled with low altitude, can disrupt airspeed control and overall stability. One witness, familiar with the airport's typical traffic, specifically noted how much lower this aircraft was compared to others routinely landing there. At approximately 2.30 p.m., the aircraft impacted the displaced threshold area of runway 20, about 170 feet short of the runway itself. The first point of ground contact was marked by evidence of initial impact, followed by a series of propeller strike marks approximately 20 feet beyond. These marks are critical. They strongly suggest that the engine was still producing power at the time of impact, indicating that a power failure was unlikely. The aircraft then flipped and came to rest inverted roughly 175 feet from the initial impact point and about 25 feet off the right side of the runway. 
it was facing in a magnetic direction of about 340 degrees, essentially the opposite direction of the intended landing. A violent post-crash fire engulfed the wreckage shortly after, destroying most of the aircraft and eliminating any possibility of survival. The fire was intense enough to obscure certain structural features, but investigators were able to confirm the presence of all major components at the scene, ruling out mid-air disintegration. Among the debris were scattered sections of the right wing, further emphasizing the force of the impact and the resulting damage. Despite the destruction, the caps was recovered intact and still packed, a clear indicator that there was no attempt or opportunity to deploy it during the emergency. Given the aircraft's proximity to the ground during the final seconds of flight, it's likely that there simply wasn't enough altitude for the system to be used effectively. The crash occurred in broad daylight under visual meteorological conditions, which adds another layer of complexity. There was no sudden weather shift, no visible obstruction, and no communication of distress. What began as a routine exercise in precision flying instead ended in a fatal impact, setting the stage for deeper technical and procedural analysis in the investigation that followed. With the release of the preliminary NTSB report, we now have a foundation of factual data that begins to clarify the circumstances of the March 20th crash. While it's too early to draw definitive conclusions, certain findings raise compelling questions and allow us to begin forming an informed, though speculative, picture of what may have unfolded during those final fatal seconds. A critical piece of this picture is the aircraft's flight attitude during the last approach. Multiple witnesses observed the Cirrus S-22 in a noticeably nose-high pitch attitude as it approached runway 20. One observer, familiar with typical landing profiles at Barwick Lafayette Airport, noted that the aircraft was flying noticeably lower than usual. A nose-high attitude in itself isn't necessarily abnormal during landing, especially in aircraft like the SR-22 with significant drag from extended flaps. However, when paired with an unusually low altitude, this combination raises serious aerodynamic red flags, particularly the risk of an incipient stall or sink rate too high for a safe touchdown. In simple terms, a nose-high attitude at low altitude suggests the pilot may have been attempting to maintain glide with insufficient airspeed. If airspeed bleeds off too far during final approach, the aircraft can lose lift and enter an aerodynamic stall. At traffic pattern altitudes, often as low as 800 to 1,000 feet AGL, there's little time or vertical space to recognize and recover from such a condition. The SR-22's engine was clearly still producing power, as evidenced by multiple propeller strike marks found approximately 20 feet past the initial point of impact. This rules out a total power loss and instead points to a situation where the aircraft remained under thrust, but control was likely lost due to either an aerodynamic stall or mismanaged energy state. There's also the matter of wind, an often underestimated factor during landing. The METAR at 2.15 p.m. showed winds out of 260 degree at 7 knots, but by 2.35 p.m., just minutes after the crash, the wind had shifted to 330 degrees at 10 knots. If we consider this transition was already underway during the accident, then during final approach to runway 20, the aircraft may have faced a quartering tailwind of up to 10 knots. That may not sound extreme, but for light aircraft like the SR-22, even small tailwinds increase ground speed on final, extend landing distance, and decrease the margin for correcting errors. In this case, a faster-than-expected ground speed combined with a low-energy nose-high attitude could have left little room for adjustments. Any attempt to stretch the glide or float to the runway may have been impossible, especially with rising sink rates near the runway threshold. The CAPS parachute system, designed as a last-resort life-saving mechanism, was found intact and packed. Its non-deployment aligns with the low altitude at which the emergency developed. Cirrus recommends CAPS activation above a minimum of 500 feet AGL in most cases. In this crash, the aircraft impacted the ground only about 170 feet before the runway threshold, suggesting there was no altitude or time margin for parachute deployment. In fast-onset emergencies like loss of control near the runway, the opportunity to recognize the danger, decide to pull, and achieve effective parachute inflation simply doesn't exist. Another area worth early attention is the dynamic between instructor and trainee. Instructional flights, particularly those involving pilots training for a commercial license, often rely on a subtle balance between giving autonomy and stepping in when needed. 
If this loss of control unfolded rapidly, it's possible that decision-making was delayed by uncertainty about who had the controls or misjudgment about whether intervention was necessary. At such low altitudes, even a delay of just a few seconds can be catastrophic. Finally, the environment in which this accident occurred adds an important layer. Conditions were reported as VMC with 10-mile visibility and scattered clouds at 4,300 feet, well within safe operating limits. The accident occurred in daylight, on a known and familiar airfield, with no reported air traffic conflicts or mechanical warnings. In many ways, this was a textbook routine flight, until it wasn't. And that's precisely what makes these early findings so important. They hint that this tragedy may have stemmed from a very narrow window of misjudgment or instability, not a cascade of systemic failures. In conclusion, while the investigation is ongoing and further technical analysis, autopsy results, and training documentation will be needed to reach a definitive explanation, the preliminary data points toward a loss of control during a low, unstable approach, one where even brief mismanagement of pitch, airspeed, or sink rate potentially influenced by shifting winds and human factors, could prove fatal. The final NTSB report will eventually provide clarity, but even now, the case underscores how quickly routine flight can become unforgiving.